This is a teaching by Pastor Nico Simmons from ICU God Ministries Online. Pastor Nico has started a new series on the book of Amos. And now, here is Pastor Nico as he teaches through the book of Amos. The title of this message is The Destruction of Israel. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we declare that you are a good God and we declare that you are a great King. Thank you that we can study your word today. It is my prayer that your Holy Spirit will open our minds so that we will understand what you want to say to us. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my Redeemer, in Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, today is our second last Bible study on the book of Amos. Throughout the last nine Bible studies, we have seen how God used his prophet to warn the people of Israel. Israel was going through an almost unprecedented period of prosperity but they had forgotten their God. They had not, however, forgotten their religion. They were still very religious. They still went to worship in their places of worship. They still did all the sacrifices. They still tithed their money. As a matter of fact, they even went over and above what the law required of them. But God sent Amos to tell them how wrong their hearts were, how two-faced they were, how sinful they were. But like so many times throughout their history, they still did not get it. They thought, they were okay. They were at ease in Zion. So, God promised a horrible affliction on them. He promised all the horrible events that would happen about 30 years later when Assyria would invade Israel and destroy Samaria. All of the woes, all of the promises of affliction, all of the declarations of destruction, all of the heavy prophecies and messages of Amos built to a climax and the focus also changes. If you remember back through our studies over the past several weeks, I have used the word affliction a lot. This is because Amos' prophetic messages up till now have pointed to a serious invasion of Israel. That was another example of God afflicting his people in order to draw them to repentance. See, that is how affliction is different than judgment. I would contend that there are only two times that God has or will judge mankind. The first was at the flood in Noah's day. The next will be the final white throne judgment. One ended in destruction by water, the other will end in destruction by fire. Anything in between those two judgments is affliction rather than judgment. Affliction is for the purpose of showing God's mercy and grace. Judgment is for the purpose of showing God's righteousness and holiness. Up until now, Amos has spoken of God's promised affliction. Those promises were ful fulfilled. Our passage today changes the focus by speaking of God's 
promised future judgment. Promises that won't be fulfilled until the end of time as we know it. Amos started off with a simple statement. He said, I saw the Lord. It is a simple statement, but what a profound statement. God revealed himself to Amos. How do you see the Lord? We have all seen the pictures of what some artists think Jesus looks like. No offense, people, but those are absolutely vile. Most of them have Jesus looking like a blonde-haired, blue-eyed, girly man. He looks more soft than he does sovereign. That is certainly not what Amos saw. Amos saw the Lord standing upon the altar. God powerfully and authoritatively revealed who he is to Amos. The attributes God revealed to Amos have never changed. God is the same yesterday, today and tomorrow. Just like Israel had a skewed picture of God, many times we have a skewed picture of him like those crazy pictures. Instead of seeing God in His fullness, we only pick out certain attributes to focus on like His love and His mercy. Do we see God as He really is? Or have we done like Israel and made Him into something He is not? Today, in this Bible study, I want each of us to see God for who He really is. To see Him as He reveals Himself in His Word. And when we see Him for who He really is, I want us to make sure He sees us the way He should. Amen. Now Amos 9 verse 1a says, I saw the Lord standing upon the altar, and he said, Smite the lintel of the door, and the posts may shake and cut them in the head, all of them. The altar was the center of the national life of God's people. This is where they made their sacrifices to their various gods. The beginning and ending of their relationship with their God was at the temple, by the altar. Yet, the northern kingdom had introduced idols into their temple. Their worship was no longer pure. And here Amos says, God will overthrow and destroy their temple in the house of God, that is Bethel. This verse continues and says, And I will slay the last of them with the sword. He that fleeth from them shall not flee away, and he that escapeth of them shall not be delivered. Now Amos 9 verse 2 to 4 says, Though they dig into hell, then shall mine hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, then will I bring them down. And though they hide themselves in the top of Carmel, I will search and take them out thence. And though they be hid from my sight in the bottom of the sea, thence will I command the serpent, and he shall bite them. And though they go into captivity before their enemies, thence will I command the sword, and it shall slay them. And I will set up mine eyes upon them for evil and not for good. This passage reminds me of Psalm 139. Psalm 139, however, has a very different tone. It reads, Where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? 
If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, you are there. Of course, the tone in Psalm 139 is all about God's care and provision. God is always there to help and to comfort us. But the opposite could also be true. For he says, I will set mine eyes upon them for evil and not for good. There is a relationship with God that if you rebel against Him, if you sin against Him, if you make a sham of Him, He will track you down. He will search you out. There will be no way for you to hide or to escape from his judgment. God is inescapable and as the psalmist puts it, this is a great comfort. But as Amos puts it, this is a serious warning. As I mentioned in Amos part 6, God is saying to the sinner, you can run but you can't hide. None of us can escape the scrutiny of God. Francis Thompson was reared in a Christian home. He even studied for the ministry for a time. But he was not willing to surrender his all to the Lord. He ran from God into the world of drugs. He did anything he had to do for a daily fix. Francis was a fugitive from God, but he did have a way with words. And one day he submitted one of his poems to the London newspaper. As a matter of fact, the publisher and his wife were so moved by the poem that they started searching all over London for its author. They finally found Francis. He had no shirt on under his rumpled coat. His shoes had holes in them. He had no gloves to protect his hands. What he had written spoke of the impossibility of escaping the inescapable God. Thankfully, eventually Francis became a Christian and the poem he wrote entitled The Hound of Heaven has become a haunting classic. Listen to a few of his lines. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the obscure ways of my own mind and in the midst of tears. I hid from him under running laughter, down titanic glooms of chasmed fears, from those strong feet that followed, followed after, but with unhurrying chase and calm pace. All things betray you who betrayest me. Think about that last line. All things betray you who betrayest me. In other words, people, are you tired of things in your life that is not going right? How come nothing works out for me? All things betray you who betrayest him. How come I never get a break? How come all my plans end up in panic and disappointment? All things betray you who betrayest me. Are you tired of searching for peace, watching it slip from your fingers like a greased Big. Like Jonah, are you tired of setting sail and always ending up in the belly of a fish? Could it be that you are running from God and the hound of heaven is running you up a tree? God loves us and will chase us to our grave. But he won't receive us until we are willing 
to be caught by him. It has been said, God will never pass the picket line of the will. Don't you think it's time for you to surrender to God today? God is in pursuit of us. At the moment, He chases us to help us. But if we resist Him, offers of grace, the day will come when He will catch up to us for judgment. Now, Amos 9 verse 5 says, for Adonai Elohim Tzavahot is the one who can melt the earth with his touch and make all who live on it mourn. It will all rise just like the Nile and then subside like the Nile in Egypt. Again, God is saying that the land will sink and rise as does the water level of Egypt's Nile. The prophet here is speaking of end time judgments when the earth will convulse and pulsate. When God will touch the earth for judgment and its fragile ecosystems will melt. Now Amos 9 verse 6a says, It is he that buildeth his stories in the heaven. You might wonder what does Amos, a backwoods prophet living in the 8th century BC, know about the geological column? Well, apparently he knew a lot. He knew it was not the result of millions of years of uninterrupted sedimentary deposits. No, he saw it as the work of God. He said God founded the strata. And Amos even knows the mechanics of God's work. This verse continues, And have founded his troop in the earth. He that calleth for the waters of the sea, and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. What founded the earth's geological layers, or its stratas? It was not the principle of uniformitarianism as things just happened today over long periods of time. Not that, no, he says, the waters of the sea covers the face of the earth. He is talking about the flood of Noah's day. It was the flood of Noah's day that shaped the earth's crust and formed the geological layers. God poured water on the earth. Amos was up to date on his geology. Now Amos 9 verse 7 says, Are ye not as children of the Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel, saith the Lord? Have not I brought up Israel out of the land of Egypt, and the Philistines from Kaftor, and the Syrians from Kerr? Now since God brought the Hebrews up out of Egypt, they thought they were immune from his judgment. But God also brought the Philistines from Kaftor, and the Syrians from Kerr. That did not give them an executive pardon. Now Amos 9 verse 8 says, Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are upon the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from off the face of the earth, saying that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, saith the Lord. Here God calls Israel the sinful kingdom, but in verse 8 he adds a ray of light which shines into the darkness. Even though the sinful northern kingdom will be destroyed, God does 
promise to save a remnant of his people. There were Israelis who would survive the Assyrian invasion. Today, those ancestors live in the land again. Modern day Israel is the fulfillment of many of the prophecies and this is just one of them. Now Amos 9 verse 9 says, For lo, I will command and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations, like as corn is sifted in a sieve, yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. After the fall of Samaria in 722 BC, Israel was scattered and they have been sifted for the last 2000 years. As Israel has been scattered across the globe and as they have gone from nation to nation, they have been persecuted and have gone to other nations and places. Even as they have come to South Africa like my great grandfather, they have been sifted and they have been tried. They have been on the edge for the last 2000 years. But here God promises that in the end Israel will not be lost. They will not fall to the ground or lose their identity. Today, the return of the Jews to their ancient homeland and the rebirth of the modern state of Israel is proof of the fulfillment of this prophecy and promise. God will save a remnant and establish them in the Holy Land. Now Amos 9 verse 10 says, all the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, which say, the evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. I have heard it said, the greatest sin of all sins is the sin of saying, I have no sin. Israel had denied their sin. Oh, the calamity will not overtake us. God will not confront us. Thus, God was unable to help them. Always remember, the only sin God won't forgive. You know the answer. The only sin God will not forgive is an unconfessed sin. 1 John 1 verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, people, the prophecy of Amos closes with five verses and five promises, each verse declaring a promise of God. In fact, we could spend the next five weeks on how God is fulfilling these promises to Israel, even in our own day. But today, I am just going to mention them to you. Number one, the restoration of the Davidic dynasty. Number two, Israel's domination of her enemies. Number three, the cultivation of the land. Number four, the accumulation of the exiles. And number five, the perpetuation of the nation. It all gets predicted in these last five verses of Amos chapter 9. What are the lessons that we can learn from this Bible study. Number one, this promised judgment fell on the nation of Israel as God declared it. This warns us that the New Testament teaching concerning the last judgment where Christ will separate saved from the unsaved, which Jesus taught so clearly in many parables is true. 
Jesus taught it in the parable of the sheep and goats, the wheat and the weeds, the wise and the foolish virgins. Jesus taught it clearly in the last verse of Matthew 25, just as the judgment declared by God through Amos in the verses before us was inescapable, so will that last judgment. Jesus is coming to judge the living and the dead. This promised judgment has a serious message for the church in every age. When Israel departed from the truth of God and followed idols, and when they would not repent of their sin, judgment came as an inevitable consequence of refusing to heed and live by the word of God. So, in every age, the church, which refuses to be obedient to the whole word of God in the Bible and subtracts from it or adds human wisdom to it and does not heed God's call to repentance, that church will suffer judgment. The judgment is a continuing thing as God withdraws His blessing, even famine of His word, until when repentance is rejected, destruction as is painted in our verses falls, and the church falls. God has sent his prophets in the past, in the church's history, and in mercy and grace, sent revival of his blessing. But the church, which ignores God's prophets, his faithful ministers, will find the same fate as is promised here in Amos 9 verse 1 to 4. There is no doubt that the church in South Africa is declining in every denomination. There is a famine of the word of God. Let us take warning from Israel's faith people. All this brings great responsibility on all faithful pastors to cry from the housetops the need for the church to repent paint and turn back to the clear and plain revelation of God in the Bible. God's people need to see the danger and the urgent in prayer that God will hold his hand and in mercy bring reviving grace. Number two. How are we to react to this revelation? In the first place, it is folly to deny this revelation. We may be gifted with a first-class brain and intellect and been able to win a PhD from a university. We may feel we can urge and disagree with how God reveals himself in this passage, but it will simply mean that our wisdom and intellect has let us down, for in the end our opinion is worth nothing, and what is deemed wisdom on earth and in time will be found to be folly in eternity. Paul tells us, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know God. Following worldly wisdom and the wisdom of the earthly wise will not change the will and purpose of God, and in the end will be found to be like a bucket with holes in it. Human beings can't contradict God and win, nor can they disregard God's will and be safe. In the light of this, for our eternal well-being and safety people, let us begin to submit to the revelation which God has given in the Bible. Let us receive it as the infallible word of God 
which it is and which the Bible claims it is and which Jesus upheld by his divine authority. Israel in the time of Amos set itself up to question the word of God through his prophet and took no notice of the revelation that God gave of himself. What did it mean for Israel? They found the word of God and the judgment he declared was all too true. And in finding out the truth when God's word was executed, they suffered complete loss. What will it be like for us if we question, change, add to or subtract from the word of God in the Bible in eternity. We shall find the experience of total loss and with no opportunity to change. It will be too late then to find out that our wisdom to be no wisdom and our unbelief to be terrible loss. There is only one way that is right and safe, and that is to receive the word of God in the Bible as God's infallible word and submit to it in obedient faith. Number three. The light shines in the second half of verse 8. God says that he will not entirely destroy the house of Jacob. What does this mean? Surely it means that while the earth remains, God's offer of grace in Christ will not entirely be withdrawn. It may be withdrawn from a nation or a church or a denomination, but there will always be somewhere God will offer His gracious forgiveness to sinners in Christ. For Israel, it meant that God always kept a remnant who were faithful to Him, and they remained even though the nation was forsaken. If the church in one place becomes apostate, there will always be a church faithful to the promises in Christ, and God's blessing will abound there. But this must never be the cause of people or a church to disregard the message of Amos. How important that every denomination in the Christendom should search their life under the scrutiny of the scripture and lay aside human wisdom and submit to the word of God and turn from unrighteous belief and human opinion. Number four. One of the things which seems to characterize even the churches which faithfully preach the truth of God in the Bible is that there seems to be little concern for the lost who are without hope and who are without God in the world. The awful fate of the lost sinners in hell does not seem to move us who believe to the danger and awfulness of being unsaved. There is no urgency to preach to the lost and to call them to flee from the wrath to come. We seem to be afraid to tell people of the reality of hell and the certainty of judgment upon sinners and the urgency of repentance and coming to Jesus Christ and crying for mercy. Can't we see in all the funerals that take place in the terrible end which the majority of the peoples of the world are going to? The warning of Jesus of journeying along the broad road that leads to destruction seems no longer to touch us and Pastors seem to be afraid to warn people of the wrath to come.
If they refuse to repent and come to Jesus to be saved. Oh, that the awful condition of being unsaved may touch the hearts of all of us that are true believers in Jesus. May the Holy Spirit give us a feeling for the lost and their eternal suffering, that we may be more urgent in prayer and witness and preaching to warn people and call and urge them to repent and come to Jesus Christ. O oh, people, that we may see how much Christ has done in love by dying for sinners like me and you, that in seeing and feeling His love, we may preach from the heart the love of God in Jesus Christ. Lord, make it so. Amen. I want to conclude Amos part 10 with this thought. Jesus died on the cross of Calvary to set you free and to give you hope for your future. He will forgive your sins, hand them over to Him. Now is the time to make a decision to follow and to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have any questions or would like someone to pray with you, we would be happy to speak with you. Give us a call at 0828282085. We are so excited for your new life in Christ Jesus. I will continue this Bible study teaching on the book of Amos next time. So be sure to join us again.